was in the Imperial Air Corps, I picked up many important skills that helped me in my training to be an astronaut. Everyone has a personal opinion on what they think is the most important skill. Someone who has no experience will think the most important skill is my ability to fly. I certainly had that in excess. The controls of all the simulators were similar enough to what my old bird had. It made that curve go by a lot quicker. But still, there were adjustments. The top G-forces in a jet could exceed what I felt in a shuttle, and I had plenty of experience pushing my maximum, including flying through darkness with only night vision to guide me home, flying nearly to the edge of the atmosphere and back to nearly the ground in minutes, all without passing out, and skirmishes with other jets so far away I couldn't even see the smoke from their wreckage. However, the Imperial family still had to make sure that not only could I handle it, but that I could respond to difficult situations in less than a second. The simulators for the shuttle were officially similar to the jet simulator, but with a lot more buttons and readings. During those training sessions, my arms felt like they were made of lead as I had to flip critical switches, respond to radio transmissions, and also recite the eight random numbers that appeared in front of the screen. Those tests were quite intense, physically and mentally. However, I proved that I was able to meet their demands and that my time in the cockpit wasn't wasted. But there were hundreds of other pilots who could prove that they were capable of the same thing. So that wasn't even close to my most important skill. Those who had a little bit of experience guessed it was my courage that was my most important skill. And courage was certainly not lacking among any of the candidates. Not merely the high adrenaline fears like falling to the ground or being in a fight, though they did test us with that, having us in situations where we were in a capsule falling towards the earth and had to deploy the chute at just the right time. Too early and we showed that we panicked and couldn't be trusted with such sensitive equipment. Deploy the chute too late? Well, you'd have the rest of your life to enjoy the view. We lost a few good pilots in that test, but the tests and their bravery were a lot more esoteric than that also. They tested nearly every phobia I could think of. We were put into complete darkness for hours at a time, not told when we could leave, confined into a tight box that you couldn't even wiggle your arms in, told to breathe slowly while a group of doctors monitored both your heart rate and your oxygen consumption. It's easy to hide your fear from the world, but it's a lot harder to hide it from yourself. If you consumed too much oxygen, you were kicked out. Most of the candidates failed that one. Other tests for fears felt like something out of a game show. Being in a box full of spiders as they crawled over you, being put through a maze in low light while infrasound played, heightening your paranoia and making visions of gray figures appear while you had three minutes to solve the maze. And even though bravery filtered out most of the candidates, that wasn't the most important skill. When there were only a dozen candidates left, it became apparent that I was the only one who had the most important skill. None of the other candidates knew when to be silent. When there were a dozen of us, they had us all in the same barracks and weird things started to happen. At first, it was something small, a missing pen, a notebook that was replaced with a blank, and then it escalated. Simulators would suddenly glitch partway through, so you went from flying to crashing immediately and had seconds to react. New cameras were found in the barracks and the bathrooms, making the other candidates feel paranoid about who was watching them. It really escalated when they started taking our pictures for Share My Day. They took our pictures both as groups and as individuals. They explained that our pictures were being shared online, but they didn't say what was being said with it. Those who said a picture w was worth a thousand words probably didn't realize that what a single caption could change about a photo. A photo of a man forcibly kissing a woman could be shared around as a sign of romance because of the right caption. Bodies of children posed to look like they were at play could be shared around as a picture of a perfect family when you erase the word funeral. A picture of an innocent person 
could easily be made into the most hated person on the planet when the caption declares them a criminal. The poses they asked us to do felt odd. Some pictures were simple, a picture of me strapped into the centrifuge with my hair styled to look fashionably blown back, even though it should logically look like a mess. Other pictures made a lot less sense for social media, such as being woken up in the middle of the night and being asked to stand over other candidates still sleeping in bed while I quietly loomed over them all. Soon after, the cafeteria with the other candidates was once full of laughing and chatting, was now full of hush whispers. I made sure not to discuss anything with anyone, a skill that was taught to me the hard way by my dad. But everyone else kept talking about their worries. Paranoid thoughts about being isolated on purpose from their families, or that their pictures were being taken of them that were being used for ulterior motives such as framing us as the bad guys. These worries felt silly to me, not because they felt invalid, but because they were talking about it with each other. It was silly that they thought their conversations or notes were private. I did not expect privacy. Every document, every conversation, every action, and every thought, I had to keep focused on the task at hand. There was always someone listening, and the sooner they accepted that, the better it would be for everyone. I knew to keep quiet and keep my thoughts to myself, and sure enough, my silence paid off. In just a few weeks, I was the only candidate left. Everyone else went home one at a time. The last candidate to leave tried passing a message to me on a scrap of paper when they shook my hand one last time. I just threw it away. Whatever it was, it wasn't my business, and they were either gonna try to make me doubt myself, or it was another test. So obviously, it was important that I never read the paper. After a few more weeks of training by myself, I was told that I was the chosen candidate. I would be the first astronaut to board the brand new orbiting space station, or OSS a test project by the Empire of the Seven Cities to see what it would take to have the astronauts survive the long trip to and from other planets in the solar system. Similar projects were being run by other groups, such as the Mad Scientist Union, the Triple Alliance, and Comet. But this would be exclusive to the Seven Cities Empire. While I didn't ask any questions, I did pay enough attention to the world situation to know why they were so insistent on doing it themselves. Decades ago, under the old emperor, the Seven Cities openly collaborated with the League of Nations to explore space, and specifically, to bring humanity to the moon. In those days, it felt like there was going to be some new glorious space age. Over 300 people from all over the world had been to the moon in less than two decades. Every nation, every kingdom, every empire, every guild, and every union had someone they could show as a visitor to the moon. Everyone had some part they played in the great pilgrimage to the moon, and many people around the world saw this space age as the beginning of permanent peace in the world. That was until the launch of the shuttle Selene 7. It was intended to be the first shuttle to bring colonists to the moon. At that point, only a few small bases existed on the moon. The shuttle exploded less than a minute after launching, with casualties well into the hundreds, both on board the shuttle and from the falling wreckage. The Emperor declared that it was sabotaged and withdrew all support from the League of Nations Selene program. All scientists who worked on the Selene program were either paper-clipped or they had to escape the Empire by heading to the Triple Alliance in the South. This greatly slowed the Selene program without the financial and scientific support of the Seven Cities, but it didn't stop the program. Not at all. And while the Seven Cities focused on imprisoning their best scientists, other nations leaped ahead. The Mad Scientist Union created a series of satellites around the world, and they were able to locate where anyone on the ground was, and how to get almost anywhere on the planet. 
They provided this technology freely to every country and person on the planet. Now this global positioning system was used for everything from navigating the roads, predicting the weather, managing military fleets, and delivering flatbreads. Countries such as the Triple Alliance, Tahuensu, Komet, and even the Middle Kingdom were sending scientific probes to every planet in reach, with talks about exploring the cloud beyond the edge of the solar system. New discoveries, theories, and experiments were being discussed constantly by their governments. The League of Nations were maintaining a network of research space stations in orbit, and even colonial bases on the moon that were almost cities upon themselves. While their scientific research didn't feel as relevant as new planets, they were still big players in the scientific community, and as far as the League was concerned, the space age was just beginning. The dreams of the entire solar system being within humanity's grasp seemed like it could be achieved very soon, and it was still anyone's game. Well, almost anyone. I love my empire, I trust my emperor, and I have faith in his divine right. But I am not stupid. If the space age was a game of pits, then everyone else was scoring hoops down in the field, while the seven cities were stuck in the stands trying to tie their shoes, while bragging to everyone else that they were going to win. Here we were in the year 2775, and we were still talking about sending a single astronaut to the only space station owned by the seven cities. And from the way everyone was acting, it was like I was going to break the biggest barrier in history. Tons of pictures were taken of me holding plaques, models of the OSS, and even pointing up at the moon in the sky like an explorer finding the horizon. People kept calling me the first imperial citizen to be in space. Again, I kept quiet not to correct anyone, but who were they fooling? Sure, it wasn't discussed a lot in schools anymore, but people do remember the old space relay, right? The message to the world from the lunar surface? I step here today, but we will all walk here tomorrow. Back in my father's day, it was the biggest moment of his life, and he talked about it like it was a religious experience. But from how everyone acted, it almost seemed like they forgot it all. They even walked me out for some meet and greets, signing pictures of myself for children and young teens. The first time a child asked me if I was going to be the first man in space, I only chuckled. By the fifth time, I stopped finding it funny as I chuckled. When adults my own age or even older asked me that question, I was at a loss at how to respond. Thankfully, by that point, my social media liaison gave me the official response. Tomorrow, I'll be breaking a lot of barriers. Just enough of an answer that no one outside of the Seven Cities would think I was claiming to be the first man in space. But anyone who asked me if I was going to be the first man in space thought I was agreeing with them. A way of answering the question without answering the question. It didn't matter what I felt about it. I knew when to keep quiet, and I knew when to listen. After the meet and greet the next day, I was strapped into Hera 1, the shuttle made for getting to the OSS. The countdown continued while I sat looking up at the sky. My thoughts focused on the mission and tried not to remember the comic I saw as a child. Of a man sitting in the rocket, thinking that every part of it was built by the lowest bidder. That wasn't technically true in the ship, but every part of it was built in one of the seven cities. And in a way, that was much worse than the lowest bidder. Every piece was overpriced and built by someone who was probably more concerned about getting the job done than doing a good job. As the last few seconds of the count disappeared, my thoughts vanished as the world below me exploded. The noise was louder than a cannon, and the pressure pushed me back in my seat as the earth tried to rip me down, and thousands of kilograms of exploding hydrogen struggled to tear me into the heavens above. After a few moments, the explosions won as I rose up and up. I struggled to keep my rocket in the correct vector as I rose higher and higher in the sky, 
making sure the shuttle made it through the digital squares on the screen in front of me. A lot of the people assumed that the shuttles simply shot up straight into the air to get where they needed to go. The truth was, there were a lot of factors to consider. The Coriolis effect, for one, could easily have me on the wrong end of the planet with no fuel if I couldn't compensate for it. And gravity, jet streams, other aircraft, spacecraft, and even space debris were all factors that dictated the vectors that Hera had to take. Even the time that the Hera launched was all factored into the process of getting me up to the OSS. The OSS orbited the planet every 90 minutes. Timing was the prime priority. If we launched too soon, we could have the OSS collide with the Hera, destroying both and leaving my body beyond burial. If we launched too late, then the OSS would be nowhere to be seen, and the Hera would have to either land back on Earth before it ran out of fuel, or land after running out of fuel. But thankfully, I hit every vector as the sky in front of me turned from blue, to gray, to blue again, to green, weirdly enough, before fading away to black with distant stars. Far more than I ever saw on Earth. The shuttle lightened as some of the rockets fell behind me. A flip of a few switches and my thrusters lit as the shuttle rushed to hit new vectors. Up here, it was different. I glanced down at Earth below and it was more beautiful than I ever imagined. Blues and greens and grays all blended below as the shuttle rushed to meet the OSS. This was one of the most delicate parts of the entire operation. Even though the OSS and the Hera were both moving over 27,000 kilometers an hour, they appeared to be barely moving at all. Relative speeds were quite interesting. I was moving faster than any vehicle on Earth, but here I had to adjust the Hera to what felt like a snail's pace. I adjusted the burners around the shuttle as I got closer and closer to the OSS. Carefully, I observed the camera as I slid the shuttle's airlock to the OSS's airlock. This reminded me of parallel parking during my driving test. Except on Earth, if I failed a parallel park, I dented a fender. If I failed this parallel parking while in space, I would dent right through the hole. I watched the camera carefully as a loud clunk rattled through the shuttle. All readings were green, I connected to the OSS successfully. Unstrapping myself, I held on to a handle by where I sat as I carefully pulled myself over to the airlock. The movies make it look like your weightlessness automatically made you careful. But the truth was, you had to be careful in the weightless environment. Because otherwise you could easily overshoot and get yourself hurt. I had training in gravity flights, and of course I experienced free fall on a jet before. But it was different in orbit. The free fall never ended here. It felt like my stomach was in my throat and it never came back down. And it didn't help that it was almost vertigo inducing. My mind wanted to orient myself so that my head was up, but there was no true up. It was wherever I was facing. The console that was once in front of me, but now it was below me as I grabbed the first tools and supplies as I made it to the airlock. A few final checks and I pushed the button opening the door to the OSS airlock. It was white and almost sterile looking. A few more buttons and I was inside the OSS. My first thought when I got inside was, it was cramped. There was a large console that took up much of the room. There was a single porthole showing the planet outside. My orientation got really screwy looking at it. It felt like the earth was below and I could fall any moment if I stepped on the glass. Then the orientation felt reversed and it became a giant sphere waiting to fall out of the sky and crush me and the OSS. I shook my head and focused back on the OSS. The room was very round but also very small. Smaller than my studio apartment on earth. There was a wall that had some straps and a sleeping bag tied to it where I would sleep. There was a large console where most of my work would take place. 
There was also a specialized exercise machine just across from the console. It would allow me to do full body workouts while in space. It would decrease the effects of microgravity and allow me to keep some of my bone, muscle, and cardiac density. And then there were the lockers. One was my bathroom, another held my equipment and personal item, and the final held all of my food that I was going to eat for the next six months. I checked the console and sure enough, there was already a message from my social media liaison down on earth. Take a selfie from the OSS and send it back. Checking my equipment locker, I saw a digital camera. I took a few pictures of myself, some with Earth in the background and others without it. Connecting the camera to the console, I sent the pictures. After a few moments, I got confirmation and then my work schedule. Looking it over, a part of my heart dropped. Every minute on the OSS was planned out over the next six months. 16 hours of work and 8 hours of sleep. Even my time for eating and using the bathroom was scheduled and I was expected to work during that time. While I expected long hours, what I didn't expect was the amount of time I would be spending with my social media liaison. Even an hour a day felt excessive to me. I understood the importance of taking lots of pictures of space for scientific research, but it felt like most of these pictures were going to be posted on Share My Day. At least, that was my assumption by the 10 hours a day I would be spending taking pictures asked for by my liaison. I don't even know their name. They never bothered to provide it to me on Earth, and now it just felt awkward to ask up here. For the rest of my day, two hours would be spent exercising and four hours would be spent providing the results of the readings from the console. Looking over the dials and readings, I realized I had no idea what most of them meant. I understood a few, such as power, temperature, oxygen levels, and even the vectors I could understand. But others were not anything I had ever seen before. There was a dial that measured something called EE, with a range of 0 to 100. There was a digital display that measured something called PKE and had fluctuating values that were always negative. And of course, attached to the work schedule was a list of rules that I would need to follow while in space. Number 1. The radio only has one frequency, ground control. It will be available for only 28 minutes during each orbit around the planet. That time is between minutes 11 and 39. Any orders received from ground control must be followed as soon as possible. Any transmissions received outside of that range of minutes 11 and 39 are not from ground control and must be ignored. Number 2. You are the only living thing to have been in space. Number three, the electronics within the OSS are quite fragile. Even crumbs and water drops can damage life support. Therefore, food and water should only be consumed during times given on your schedule. If it's consumed outside of the scheduled times, inform ground control and follow the directions. Number four, you are the only human who's ever been in space. Number five, Nothing lives out in space. If you hear something knocking on the outside of the hole, it isn't alive. Don't let it in. Don't go outside. Don't look at it. It'll leave you alone if it thinks the OSS is empty. Number six. Nothing dies out here. Number seven. There should be no other satellites, shuttles, nor vehicles visible at any point during the orbit. If that changes, take a picture of what you see and send it to your liaison. Do not ask ground control for help. They'll hear you. Number eight. You are the only Imperial citizen to have been in space. Number nine. Occasionally you'll see the moon through the cameras. It will be safe to view and it is encouraged to look at. If the moon turns silver, set the cameras to record and stop looking at the moon immediately. Send the video to your social media liaison without looking at it, marking the video as Silver Moon 
timestamp it started. It should return to normal and be safe to look at 8 minutes after it turned silver. Number 10. No one has ever seen all of the moon's phases before. Number 11. If the moon turns black, you have one minute to turn off the radio. Leave the radio off as long as the moon is black. Leave the radio off for an additional minute after it returns to normal. Do not record the black moon. Do not take pictures. She likes being heard, not recorded. Do not tell anyone about the black moon, not even your liaison. If you do not turn off the radio, the howls will change something in you that you don't want changed. 12. Don't listen to the moon. It doesn't lie, but you'll wish it did. 13. If the planet below changes, record it all on cameras, regardless of the color of the moon and or moons, and turn off the radio during the event. Ground control will be unreachable. Take plenty of pictures too and send them to your liaison after the planet returns to normal. The planet should return back to normal after one full orbit. Number 14. The OSS was built only by the Empire of the Seven Cities and no one else. 15. It's easy to get paranoid in space. Keep talking with ground control every day to keep yourself centered. If you start experiencing hallucinations, inform your liaison. If they tell you it's okay to tell ground control about your hallucinations, then tell ground control and follow their directions. Number 16. There's only one OSS. Any other orbiting space stations are not the OSS. 17. You may play music at any point during your mission. If music plays without you turning it on, turn it off at your convenience. The music player tends to glitch. If the music player stops without you telling it to, leave it off for the rest of the orbit. That's not a glitch. Number 18. Your liaison can be reached at any point during orbit. Doesn't mean they'll always respond. Number 19. If you wish to contact someone on ground other than ground control or your liaison, inform your liaison, tell them who you want to contact, and provide the message in full. If they decide it's not a risk to Imperial security, they will pass on the message. If someone wants to contact you, your liaison will decide if it's best to send it to you or if it's better to censor it. 20. Trust your social media liaison. Trust yourself only with their say-so. Number 21. Do not take the shuttle back to Earth except on the return date, regardless of the situation. If you leave too soon, you may never return. If you return too late, you'll never leave. Number 22. If you see anything strange, it can be explained. Take pictures and send them to your liaison. They'll explain it to you. Eventually. Reading the rules reminded me of something else about my dad when I was growing up. The amount of times he would contradict himself, and when reality agreed that he was wrong, then clearly reality was in the wrong. He would not put up with anyone disagreeing with how he saw the world. He lost a lot of jobs that way when he inevitably got into fights with his boss about how he was right. I remember all the times he came home complaining to my mother about how all of his co-workers were idiots and how whatever they did or what my mom did or what I did was always wrong. Even as a child, that didn't feel right, but I learned quickly not to say anything. Silence meant safety from someone who thought themselves as right. It meant they didn't target you, they didn't care what you actually thought, but as long as you didn't question it, they wouldn't try to make it so you would see it their way. I read the rules one more time before I decided to employ my most important skill again. Remaining silent. I get started with my schedule as I record the readings on the dial in front of me, writing the readings down, filling in the spreadsheet, 
and when I was done, I was to send the results to my social media liaison. Of course. I record the negative values on the dial marked PKE just as the music player came on and started playing an unfamiliar violin tune. First few days were normal as I expected. The OSS has an orbit of 90 minutes, so technically my day is an hour and a half long instead of 24 hours, and it occurs 18 times in a 24 hour period. However, biologically and legally, my internal clock was based in the seven cities. My console even had two separate clocks, one based on the 24 hour cycle, the other based on the 90 minute orbit. So I knew where I was in orbit, and more importantly, what time it was. The only task given to me by my liaison during those first few days was take pictures of the world below. Well, that was how they phrased it. The world below. But honestly, looking at the earth, it filled me with a feeling of awe I had never known before. Every living thing, every thought, and every great deed in history was all below me. I couldn't help but feel both how incredible and yet fragile it all was. The world was full of greens, blues, and so many wonderful colors. I could also see the gray scars left across Europa from the Great War that ended nearly a century ago. Even with restoration efforts and nature trying to heal, the chemicals, the weapons, and the soldiers all left gashes where nothing could grow. Even from space, it was clearly visible. That was something from so long ago. Modern industry stuck out even more than those faded wounds. At the line where day and night met, I could clearly see the atmosphere with white sunlight filtering through it. It also filtered through the smog and the pollution of the world. The way light filtered through, it was like it was an old lens. The color wasn't right and it was foggy, but unless you were looking for it, you never saw it. But once you saw it, you could never miss it again. The factory towns were an even darker shade of gray, the pollution making the wilds just belong the factories a sickly color. But there was also beauty in the industrialized world. The way all the lights came on when night fell, the cities below were like fairy lights, strengthening where the sun weakened. Brilliant stars twinkled below with enough radiance and warmth to rightful all of the stars above. Those were wonderful pictures I sent to my liaison, who seemed happy enough to have them. I didn't get much input, just that I was doing a good job. A week into my six-month-long mission, something odd happened. I dreamed about floating underwater with dancing glowing fish when the fish suddenly swam away. I looked around and saw a distant flashing. I couldn't see what it was, but it was deep in the water, and every nerve in my body screamed, freeze. Whatever that flashing was, it wanted me to get closer. I would remain safe as long as I remained still and silent. A loud knock shocked me back to the waking world before the lights could flash again. In the low lights of the OSS, I couldn't see where the knocking was coming from. At first, I rationalized it was a part of my dream. But then I heard the knock again. It rang throughout the entire OSS and it made everything in the station vibrate. I was worried that something impacted the OSS, but none of the alarms were going off. Still, I unstrapped myself from my sleeping bag and drifted over to the console. No damage was detected and no alarms were going off. So instead, I flipped through the external cameras, and after a few tries, I found what I was looking for. I wish I didn't. Secured to the OSS by grabbing a handle near the airlock was another astronaut. They lifted their hand to the airlock as they knocked on it, 
creating another loud ring throughout the OSS as their fist collided with the metal. I saw their name tag on their arm, so I adjusted the zoom on the camera to get a closer look at the name, and my heart stopped and my breath froze when I saw it. Samuel Lastaname was the name on the patch. My name. Whoever that was outside wore my suit. I glanced over to where my suit was stored. It was still there, so who was outside and how did they get a suit just like mine? I glanced back at the camera and felt my heart thump like an angry rabbit when I saw what was on the screen. The mysterious astronaut turned to face the camera. I could see that the visor was shattered and underneath it, I could see what was in the suit. A skeleton with no flesh left on its sun-bleached bones smiled back at me through the camera. I stayed frozen while I waited to see what else it would do. The necronaut pounded on the airlock one last time before letting go of the handle and drifting off into space. I watched the camera as it drifted further and further away from the OSS while I thought back to the rule. I wasn't supposed to let them know that I was in here, otherwise they would try to get in. I thought about informing my liaison, but then my most important skill kicked in. They had very clearly written that I wasn't supposed to look at what knocks. If my liaison knew that I broke a rule, then I would make myself a target. But if I stayed silent, then everybody back on Earth would know nothing about my mistake. So, after my heart rate calmed down, I drifted back to my sleeping bag and let myself fade back to sleep. It was an adjustment at first, getting used to sleeping with no gravity to pull me down. I forced myself to relax as I drifted off to sleep, where I dreamed of bright flashes in darkness. They sprang into existence and streaked across the horizon like fireworks, but unlike fireworks, they never fell down. They rose and flew until they faded away only to appear again elsewhere. When I woke up, I already had half a dozen emails from my liaison. They were all repeats of the same email sent once every 30 minutes for the last three hours. We believe Rule 13 will be in effect today. Be prepared to view the event from 0800 to 0930. And thankfully, as a reminder, my liaison included the rule for my convenience, but I still had it memorized. Rule 13. If the planet below changes, record it on all cameras regardless of the color of the moon and or moons, and turn off the radio during the event. Ground control will be unreachable. Take plenty of pictures too and send them all to your liaison after the planet returns to normal. The planet should return back to normal after one full orbit. I checked my time. It was just 0645 now. So I quickly went through all of my checks. The cameras were all on and operational. Most of them faced the planet below. A few others were pointed out towards the moon and to where the stars were. I even had the record button ready while I waited for the event to start. It was 0758 when I finished my preparations. I stared down at the clock waiting for it to hit 0800 my hands shaking while I waited for the planet to change. I wasn't sure what to expect. Would it just change a little bit and I would have to strain to see small differences in the lights and shadows below? Or maybe the entire planet would be replaced and then I would be looking down at a bustling alien world. I waited impatiently, barely breathing as the clock finally ticked over from 0759 to 0800. I pressed record and turned off my radio as I closed the clock and opened the camera looking down at the planet. Whatever was supposed to happen, I didn't see it. The planet looked the same underneath the sunlight. The continents were all there, the river still flowed, and the oceans were still blue. But then I saw a difference. There were no cities or settlements as far as I could see. Where all the cities were, were only a bunch of ugly, bleached scars. 
It resembled the poisoned land from the Great War, but on a much, much larger scale. Thousands of acres of lifeless land stood where all the cities were. But the air was nothing like the land. The air was clear and clean. I never imagined it would get so clear. But I took pictures of the planet, looking over every detail I could. Kart Kadash was just more green grassland on the borders of the Central Sea. The Middle Kingdom was more desert than anything else. And the northern forest was almost completely frozen over. The ice sheets extended as far south as Albion, and yet the oceans were still where they were supposed to be. Which didn't make sense. That could only happen if there were billions upon billions of tons of additional water on the earth that was then frozen again. But even as I took my pictures, I realized I wasn't done with surprises when I passed the day night line. The planet was dark on the night side. No lights at all, no lightning bug vehicles, no fairy city lights. There weren't even candlelight campfires. The sparks of industrialization were all snuffed out, leaving the night sky a cold, dark pit. If there were no campfires and no lights, then where did everyone go? Was the entire population gone? Or were they hiding? My heart leapt into my throat from that thought. I had been alone before, but this wasn't staying home alone, camping alone. And it wasn't even being in space alone. I was even more lonely today than any other human in history. At least Adam had a garden. I may have been the only one in this tiny biosphere, but yesterday there were humans down below that I could reach with my radio or my console, but now I am the only human in existence as far as I could see. That dread filled every bone of my body like I was injected with freezing saline, but as I was overwhelmed by the scope of these thoughts, I tried to remember back to Rule 13. It said the planet would go back to normal in just 90 minutes. I glanced down at the dark planet and took another photo, just as another anxious thought invaded my state of mind. What if the rule was wrong? I shook my head and let my most important skill take over. Remain silent. I focused on those two words and nothing else. Remain silent. After nearly a minute of mental silence, I let my thoughts work again. All I had to do was follow the rules. I will follow them and trust them to get me home. If they couldn't get me home, then I can figure it out then. But otherwise, I will have to assume that the rules knew what they were talking about. I could panic when the crisis is over. If I panic during the crisis, then it would never be over. Another helpful skill for my family. After I took a cleansing breath, I checked the cameras on the OSS, and then I saw something else that dropped my weightless heart. Beyond the moon, there were no stars. I don't mean that it was dark. I mean that there were no stars, no galaxies, no light, nothing beyond the moon. One of the enduring constants of the OSS is the fact I could see stars and even the galaxy. Universal lighthouses that told me where I was in the universe. But now, they were all gone. With the exception of Sol in his eternal glory. I watched the cameras that watched this space beyond the moon, as I tried to see just one thing beyond the moon. But... It was all just void and darkness beyond the white moon. And as much as I didn't want to, I glanced towards the moon, just to have something to look at other than empty darkness. Luna's face was familiar and unchanged. Her many seas and deserts were pale and familiar as I listed the mares I could remember. 
As I got to Mare Imbrium, I saw something else on her surface. I could see the glint of steel piercing her face. The bases from the League of Nations. I focused the camera on the Imbrium base, but the camera wasn't strong enough to see any details. But I could see steel on the moon. And if there was steel on the moon, then there was a base on the moon. And if there was a base on the moon, then there had to be people there. Right? But then I saw the glint of something beyond Luna's reach. I focused the camera beyond the moon to see what, what glinted. And after a moment and my angle changed, I saw what reflected Sol's rays. The space beyond was not dark because there was nothing beyond, but because there was a superstructure beyond the orbit of the moon. As far as I could see in every direction, there were dark solar panels held together by massive steel connectors. Each panel was many times the size of the planet, and the connectors were longer than the planet was round. The inner solar system was inside of a giant celestial sphere. Every panel harvesting every photon of energy from Sol. My hands shook when I thought about everything that was required for the celestial sphere. A single connector had more steel than could be harvested from the entire planet. Every panel would take more sand than can be found on every shore, from every sea, from every planet in the solar system. And there were hundreds here. Whatever intelligence or civilization that was able to build the celestial sphere had industry that exceeded entire solar systems working together and was quite possibly on a galactic or even universal scale. Whatever built the celestial sphere not only could spend the resources to harvest all the energy from Sol, but they decided that it was worth the cost to do so. How many other stars in the dark sky had celestial spheres built around them? How many dark spots in the universe actually had a star, but was being hidden and harvested? Any civilization that had this power would have the power to wipe out the entirety of the Earth just to have a little extra light. History was full of examples of the strong killing the weak just to have more resources. But at this scale, whoever engineered this celestial sphere was so beyond humanity, I don't think any power could stand up to them. Is that what happened to the cities and nations below? Did humanity just get inconvenient to these engineers? Did humanity try to fight back? Or did they simply surrender? Did humanity strike first? Or did the engineers strike so quickly we never knew what happened? I wondered as I let go of the console. I let the feeling of powerlessness wash over me before I took a deep breath and focused down on the planet. Even if it wasn't my Earth, it was still beautiful. There were oceans, forests, and mountains that peeked through the cloud cover. No matter what power built the celestial sphere, Earth remained. Wind and rain both flowed, plants still grew, and life still lived. Whatever cosmic colossus constructed this celestial sphere didn't stop life from living. So, I was never truly alone. The Earth remained, even without me, and even without my species. And as odd as it sounded, that thought comforted me as I grabbed the console and took more pictures of the planet below as the music player turned itself on and started playing a song. The moon floats lonely in the empty sky. There's no stars above to watch her dance by. No people below to witness her sing. Even in her spotlight, kept inside a ring. 
But still in the silent place she still swings. I've heard the song many times on Earth. An emotional song about something that I never thought about. But here, the words and the eerie music felt like it had a different meaning. I glanced back at the camera that still peered towards the moon that was now almost completely eclipsed by the earth. It almost felt like she was waving goodbye to me. While I watched the moon, I felt a pang of regret in my heart as she disappeared. Like I was saying goodbye to a friend. One last time. But then the orbit clock clicked, indicating that the orbit was now over. I checked the cameras that peered down towards the Earth, and sure enough, the cities were back and the planet was back to normal. I let out a sigh I didn't know I was holding. And it was anxious that I was going to be trapped forever in a world without humanity. I turned on the radio, waiting for the time I would be able to communicate with ground control once again. And while I waited for them to respond, I uploaded my pictures to my liaison. When I noticed the moon was on screen again, it was no longer eclipsed by the planet and it was in full visibility of the cameras. Every nerve in my body was both electrified and frozen at the same time. Like I was stuck in an ice storm. The moon on screen wasn't the pale white of Luna. The moon wasn't in shadow either, like it was a new moon. The screen showed a perfect sculpture of the moon, made out of obsidian. Every crater, every sea, every mountain, every rock, and every grain of dust, made out of obsidian. Rule number 11. If the moon turns black, you have one minute to turn off the radio. Leave the radio off while the moon is black. Leave the radio off for an additional minute after it returns to normal. Do not record the black moon. Do not take pictures. She likes being heard, not recorded. Do not tell anyone about the black moon, not even your liaison. If you don't turn off the radio, the howls will change something in you that you don't want changed. I stopped recording and then flipped the power switch for the radio, but it didn't turn off. I flipped the switch again, on and off, but the radio still didn't turn off. Feeling panic in my throat, I tried muting the radio, turning it down. Something, anything to keep sound from coming through the radio. But none of it worked. Somehow, I was locked out of the radio. I looked around the room for something to keep the sound from the radio from reaching me. Maybe I could get into my extravehicular activity suit and wait on the outside of the OSS while the moon returned to normal. No, I couldn't get into my suit and get out of here in time. Maybe I could use the sleeping bag to cover the radio to muffle the sound? No, it may still get out, but... Then I saw the airlock, and an idea occurred to me. I drifted quickly over to the airlock between the OSS and Hera-1. I quickly pulled the lever and drifted into the airlock, just as sound started to play on the radio. It only played for a second while the airlock was closing, but in that second I heard a howl. It was a mournful howl that reminded me of a wolf, but also of someone mourning, and somehow also like someone else singing, all at once. The sound resonated through my body as the door closed, and I was left back in the silence. I stared through the small window of the airlock into the OSS directly, and I watched the screen and waited for the moon to return to normal. And while I waited, I felt my muscles start to untense while I started breathing again. Whatever was over the radio, I could still feel the resonance. Even though I could no longer hear the howl, I felt like I could 
feel it through the airlock's door. The sound traveling as vibrations through the doors and up my arms, and it made me feel like something shifted inside of me. I let go of the airlock and just hovered there as I let the resonance of the black moon fade away from my mind. Every breath I took, I felt more and more like myself. The resonance was gone, and whatever was changing in me, I think I stopped it. I must have closed the airlock in time, and as far as I could tell, I was still myself. I watched the monitor through the window and saw the moon fade back to normal. I waited two minutes after the moon went back to normal before opening the airlock. Pure silence within the OSS. I then drifted over to my console to send my pictures of the strange world to my liaison. And then after I sent the pictures, my eyes drifted throughout the OSS, and then I noticed something new. In the middle of the room was a hatch that led deeper into the OSS. I half drifted and half crawled towards the hatch, and I could see that it had both a lever to open it and a window to show me what was below. Frozen fear dripped down my spine as I peered through the glass. I noticed that there was a ladder leading down into the darkness and a few blinking lights, but something in me told me danger lived below the hatch, especially since the hatch wasn't there just a few minutes ago. The console dinged, notifying me that my liaison sent me a message. I stared at the hatch for another moment while I thought about asking my liaison about it. The rules did say to let them know if I saw anything that couldn't be real. I glanced at the console and drifted over as I decided to employ my most important skill. I imagined that conversation with my liaison. I would tell them I saw a hatch in the middle of the OSS and they would ask me if something happened to me before I saw it. Then I would have to tell them that I heard the Black Moon's howl, and then something bad would happen to me for breaking the rule. Another lesson I learned from my father growing up. If you told him that you broke the rule, the consequences were far more severe than if he found out himself. If this rule was severe, they would already know about the rule being broken, and if they didn't say anything, they didn't care about how it hit. At least until I brought it up. This thought reassured me as I opened my console to check the message. What was on my screen was something that should not be possible. I had a message from someone who wasn't my liaison. The message had it marked as being from someone called the Red Prince. And unlike messages from my liaison, which immediately displayed, the console asked me if I wanted to read it or not. At first, I hovered my cursor over the No button, but something in me brought me pause. It wasn't a cold feeling, like when I saw the celestial sphere. It was warm and fluttery within my rib cage. Like something in me was waiting to see this message for a long time, and now it couldn't wait to see it. I haven't felt anything like this before. I never had any messages addressed personally to me. Not in many years. I didn't have time for relationships or friends while serving in the Imperial Air Corps. My job and my empire came first above everything else. I always figured I would have time for friends and relationships after my ambitions were done. I definitely didn't have family messages to look forward to either. My brother was working as a barista or something in River City, and I didn't bother responding to his texts when he told me that he broke up with his girlfriend. My sister, on the other hand, was married to her career as a surgeon in Swamp City. And while we didn't text very often, from what I figured, 
She had multiple clients every day, and she was busy every night. My father was living somewhere off the grid in Scythia, probably getting into drunken brawls with horses. My mother told me that I was dead to her when I told her that I broke up with an engagement with my high school sweetheart to focus on my career. So we haven't spoken in a long time. But this was genuinely exciting to me. A message directed to me from someone I didn't know. Every message I dealt with for the last 20 years was all business. My heart fluttered again as I drifted the cursor over the yes, and I clicked it. Red text filled the console screen in front of me as I read it over. Dear Samuel Lastaname, my name is Red Prince. You don't know me, but I am a private investigator from River City, and I was recently hired by your brother to try and bring you back to reconcile you both. Normally, it is a lot easier to find someone, but you have been hidden away for a long time. And now that you have been found on the OSS, I have to warn you. We believe that you may be in danger. For the last six months, the last official record of you is that you are working for the Imperial Air Corps for an unknown mission. But I did some digging and found that you were working for the Seven City Space Agency on the Argus program. At this time, I do not have all the details. I believe you are in an orbiting space station and you were sent to test paths connecting Earth to other worlds. There are a few things I can tell you and a few assumptions I can make. Your liaison thinks they control all of your information but I am sending you a message through vantha.net and you can respond in kind safely. But I have to implore you, do not trust your liaison. Something else I can tell you with certainty is the OSS is much larger than you are led to believe. Parts of it are hidden via esoteric means. However, I'm not sure if it's to keep something safe from you or to keep you safe from something else. So I will need your help figuring that out. Eyes drifted over to the hatch as another shiver ran down my spine as I scrolled down and continued reading. I believe, and this is an assumption, that there are other OSS is around the planet. I don't know how many at this time, but I have evidence of at least a dozen others. Every one of them had astronauts sent up who were hidden from public view, and none were told about any of the other stations. So whatever their plans are with you, I doubt it's good. And my final assumption, I believe there is something living with you on the OSS called an Arcana. Until I know exactly which one, I cannot guarantee safety. But I believe working together we can contain and capture it. But we should still be cautious, just to be safe. I know you don't have any reason to trust me. You're probably thinking about turning me into your liaison, who would tell you I am a hallucination, and then I can expect a knock on my door around 3 a.m., and then I would not be a bother to anyone ever again. But I do have a few reasons for you to trust me. There was nothing in the rules about other messages getting to you, or that even being a possibility. I also know about the rules. There is also the fact that your brother, Ethan, hired me to help find you. He's doing a lot better now than the last time you both spoke. He wants to reconcile with all of his family, starting with you. And while that may seem easy to fake, do you honestly think the Vigilees would think to trick you with your brother? I nod at that last line. It was a fair point. I never got along with Ethan. If the Vigilees were being smart, they would have said the message was coming from my sister. So this was probably true. 
If you want to help me, please feel free to respond. And I have one final question for you to show you why you should trust me. Does the black moon howl? That last line stopped my heart. How? How would the Red Prince know about the Black Moon howling? That question made the small flutter turn into a full-on flurry of fireflies as I started typing my response. I will help you, but what is Project Argus? What is a path? And why do you think there are multiple OSSs? And most importantly, how did you know that the Black Moon howls? She mourns while she sings. I responded. I stared at the console for a few minutes, waiting for a response. Every moment, it felt like a fist tightened around my heart. Who was this person? What do they know? And how are they in contact with me? But still, was it any less weird than seeing the planet change? We're seeing a superstructure put out every star in the universe. The console beeped, informing me I had a message, but the actual message dried out my throat. The message was from my liaison. Rule 13 will be in effect beginning the next orbit. I turned to check the orbit clock, which just flipped from 89 minutes to 90. It was beginning all over again. I gulped when I turned to the cameras, which showed me numerous shattered satellites, all in a decaying orbit. And the planet below was a sickly gray. The smoggy cloud cover was so thick, I couldn't see any of the planet's features. I couldn't tell if it had mountains, oceans, or even if the planet had a surface at all or if it was all just dust and gas and smoke, all the way to the planet's fiery core. I was still staring down at the planet when the radio crackled to life and a woman's voice could be heard. This is not a place of honor. The radio continued its grim warning. There is no honor to be had here, only danger. The danger is to the body, mind, and soul. We considered ourselves to be a powerful civilization, and it destroyed us. The danger is long-lasting and will still be here when you listen. The only things that remain are the dead and those that wish they were dead. To any who remain alive in space, do not come to grave. You will only carry the danger beyond the planet to new worlds. There was silence for a moment before the message began to repeat. My name is Tiffany Riley, sole standing seraphim of the Republic of the Seven Cities. Our planet is not a place of life. There is only death here. This message is a warning for anyone who remains alive beyond the planet. Grave isn't safe. This is not a place of honor. I took more pictures of Grave below. Listening to the recorded voice, I wished I could tune the radio into other frequencies, but like the rules said, the radio only had one frequency. The cameras around the OSS showed many broken satellites that almost looked like they were broken from the inside. And, of course, I checked the moon again. Luna was sickly. The bases were all much larger. The Imbrium base practically filled the entire sea, making a third of the moon's face shining steel and glittering glass. I could also see large red-brown patches on the Regolith that looked like smeared lipstick across Luna's broken face. The worst part was the moon's new craters. Mericrisium on the eastern part of the moon's face was three times as large and made out of blasted glass, and the Tycho crater had the biggest change. What was in my world a peaceful white crater that was easily visible from Earth was now a glass scar. 
The apparent remnants of Steel City were clearly nuked. Molten metal and rock fused into one and twisted beyond recognition. Like a deity, playing with clay, baking it halfway, and then leaving it in the rain. Cracks ran for miles in spidery veins of white, black, silver, brown, glass, and even most hauntingly of all, scarlet. And in the center of the radioactive glass crater, something was both moving and alive. What grew in the middle of the crater in the white sunlight resembled a tree in shape. It was like a manzanita, a tree, smooth and red looking in the lunar soil, except manzanita didn't grow larger than the mountains. The branches of manzanita trees were a mix of red bark, steel, glass, and rock that moved in the non-existent breeze with a regular pulse. Trees also didn't have roots that grew thousands of miles, pulsing and undulating, more akin to pulsing veins than gradual growth. The roots more closely resembled tentacles, or blood vessels, that connected and diverged from each other at random points. And manzanita trees didn't grow yellow fruits with red knotted veins. It felt like this was something worth taking a picture of, so I zoomed into the tree on the moon to take a few pictures. But when I zoomed in, I saw that what I thought were yellow fruits growing all over the tree was actually yellow eyes. Each eye was hundreds or even thousands of meters large. The sclera was jaundiced yellow, and the veins pulsed and were as thick as roads, and the iris was as red as blood and the pupils. The pupils were dark and deep as the abyss. Even the smallest of eyes was large enough to drown the OSS in its entirety without even needing to blink. I snapped a photo when every eye on the tree shifted and stared towards the OSS. I felt like I was in a staring contest with an eldritch intelligence. It stared at me through the cameras the abyss within all the eyes. It judged as it stared through the camera and into me. I stared back, and it felt like I was staring for hours, but must have only been a few minutes. As I stared into the abyss, I felt resonance from the howl shake through me. It's hard to explain, but where the howl earlier came from, this time... It was like the resonance came from my bones, and the howl escaped from my throat as I stared down the abomination on the moon. The howl that echoed in the OSS no longer felt mournful. It was a warning, a threat, and a promise. A promise from whatever that was on the moon. If it tried to hurt me, I would hurt it a lot worse. And as that howl echoed, I felt powerful and secure. And in that moment, I was certain I could face any threat. And I could even rip the celestial sphere that once overwhelmed me into dust. As the howl echoed for the last time, I stared as the eyes in the video widened. Almost like the Tycho Abomination was aware of the Black Moon, and somehow heard her howl hundreds of thousands of kilometers away, through the vacuum of space. Then the the abyss within those many eldritch eyes did something I never thought could happen. They turned away from me, almost like it was out of fear. I stared into the abyss, the abyss stared back, and it was scared of what it saw within me. I touched my throat where the howl came from, that strength that was inside me faded too, but I could still feel some warmth remaining, almost like a memory of the strength remained within my muscles. A welcome change from all the cold fear I'd been feeling all day. I flipped the cameras to focus on Grave, the planet below, then I realized the voice on the radio wasn't repeating the same message. Who is that? Hello? 
Is anyone out there? Does the black moon howl? Tiffany asked. Those final words caused something to shift inside of me. It was like a snake made of emotion and power unfurled from around my heart and crawled up my throat before slithering out as words as I spoke. Only when commanding her legion, I said on the radio, not sure why I responded the way I did. There was a pause before she continued. You're alive, and you must be Samuel Lastaname. Have you spoken to the Red Prince? Do you have the means of contacting her? She sounded desperate, like she knew it was already a long shot, but it was all she had. So I responded to the radio. How do you know my name? And I kind of know the Red Prince. I mean, she sent me an email, but I think it, I'm out of contact with her right now. What is going on? I got your name from a story the Red Prince once told me. The Star Sailor was lost through space and time, never in one place, changing on a dime. Penultimate Legion of the Black Moon, first hero of the Seraphim, marooned. She told me of an astronaut named Samuel Lastaname visiting Kardashev, Primeval, and many other worlds, and how you connected with other shards of all that is. I don't know what's going on in the OSS, but I do know that Red can help you. But can you bring her a message from me? She will know who Tiffany Riley is. I checked my orbit clock. Somehow, there were only a few minutes left before my orbit reset. I would be out of range very quickly. I could simply go quiet. My radio wouldn't turn off, but I didn't have to respond. I remember back on Earth when another candidate tried to pass me a note. I just ignored it and threw it away, never even looking at it. This would be even easier. I didn't even have to respond, and she would never know that I ignored her. But something in me didn't want to ignore Tiffany. And for the first time, for as long as I can remember, I decided not to be silent. Okay, I will bring a message to her, but be quick, I only have a few minutes. I said into the radio while I wondered why I did that. It was not even a second after I was done speaking before Tiffany relayed her message to me. Tell Red that the eleventh plague is coming. It is vital she takes up her heater when I take up my own. If she waits too long, the eleventh plague will turn Earth into grave. Wait, what's the eleventh plague? Did you see what was living on the moon? What's down on the planet is a lot worse. I glanced down at the atmosphere, which was still gray and foggy as Oceanus. But I could see movement underneath the fog, almost like something was circling the OSS underneath. But something that large to stir up the air in the clouds like that would have to be at least the size of a continent. Dwarfing not just the abomination on the moon, but the moon itself. The next part of my message is more personal, but no less important. Tell the Red Prince, tell her that she's my dearest friend and that I always loved her ever since I met her. I never got the chance to tell her this and she deserves to know. Please tell her. For me. At her final word... The orbit clock clicked, and the clouds below parted to reveal a blue and green earth for me. Tiffany Riley, gone as a ghost, while the consul told me that I had a new message from the Red Prince. I know the Black Moon howls because I know many things. But from your response, it seems you you heard her. Be warned. Though you may use some of her power, you cannot command, control, contain, or even consume her power. The use... Use too much power and you will be overwhelmed or even killed. I advise against using any power or magic that may appear to you, at least until you get back to Earth. That being said, here are a few things I can provide for you to follow up on. Look out for anything that looks like a small playing card or even has 
a Roman numeral on it. That will be the Arcana. Most likely, I think they're easy, they're either using two, the High Priest Priestess, sixteen, the Tower, the eighteenth, the Moon, or twentieth, Judgment. These are the only Arcana, major or minor, that can create paths. Inform me if of anything strange you've seen that feels esoteric. Any information about the worlds you visit can also be helpful. I have reasonable assumption that the Arcana is kept in a hidden section of the OSS, and I believe that the Argus is a reference to observing Altus, not merely the nations of Earth, but all that is. So logically, the Emperor is using the OSS and the Arcana within not merely to observe the paths between the worlds, but to create them. Every path opened is a source of trade, observation, and power, all owned by the Emperor. A hidden advantage is that the other nations can't even dream of. So let's see if we can find that information. If it isn't on your console, it'll be in the hidden section of the OSS. My recommendation is to check your console for hidden files or directories, and then if you cannot find anything, only then check out the hidden section, but only with great caution. Try to find anything with keywords, Argus, Paths, Altus, or Arcana. Let me know if you find information, and I will inform you if something else has come my way. But if you find any information, please inform me. Message said. I uploaded the recording of Grave to my liaison while I thought about how I would phrase the message to Red Prince. So I typed back to her. I was briefly in the orbit of a planet called Grave. There was someone called Tiffany Riley on the radio who wanted me to warn you of something. It was specifically to the Red Prince. She said that the 11th plague was coming and to take up the heater when she did. I don't know what heater she was referring to, but I'm going to assume that you know what that means. She also told me that you were her dearest friend and she loved you ever since she met you. Again, I'm not sure what any of this means, but she considered it important enough to tell a complete stranger to pass on the message to you. Oh, and also she told me you knew about me under the name of the Star Sailor? Is that how you know me? Is there any information about something called the Seraphim or the Legion of the Black Moon? She had a whole prophecy mentioning the Star Sailor being a part of them both. I will check over the OSS as far as I can see if I can find any references to Project Argus or to any Arcana, and keep an eye out for anything else that's weird. Best of luck on Earth! After sending the message, I wondered if it was too intimate of a closing statement. We didn't know each other, and quite honestly, she was someone hired by my brother to help me out. There was no obligation for her to be nice to me other than the fact she was hired. Still, even as I thought about if there was better ways to sign off, I did some snooping on my console. My initial search told me about as much as I thought I knew about the console. It only had one accessible program, act as an electronic post box solely between me and my liaison. I had no idea how Red managed to bypass it, but when I responded to the message that I got from her, her message simply disappeared, with no way for me to contact her or reread the old messages. But after my initial search, I tried something new. I checked the technical specifications of the console itself. The OS was old, a double I Model 7. The same operating systems used by both cash registers and military archivists all over the world for being reliable and too expensive to update, while most businesses and citizens used double I Model 11. Every piece was built by the lowest bidder, I reminded myself as I checked the physical specifications of the console. 
There, I found something that was very unusual. The RAM, essentially how fast the computer could process information, was a lot larger than it reasonably should. A little over 256 gigabytes of RAM. For perspective, that's the processing power of 32 standard computers working on the same problem at the same time. But my email program was capped at only 4 gigabytes. So what were the other 252 gigabytes being used for? But the storage capacity was an even bigger surprise. Most computers have a terabyte or two in storage capacity. Sometimes a lot more, but generally that's how much it was. The console on the OSS that was roughly the size of a microwave and running the same email program that hadn't been updated in 20 years somehow had the storage capacity of 5 petabytes, or even more storage than could be held on 5,000 standard computers. That was impossible. Even with the most advanced virtual storage known to the MSU, that hardware could not be stored on a console that was clearly meant to be a thin client. These were the statistics of a server farm, and that kind of hardware would need its own separate room with a powerful source of energy, strong coolant, or HVAC to keep the processors from overheating, and there was no room for such a thing on the OSS. Except maybe in the hatch. I glanced over at the hatch. That very well could be hiding away a server farm or maybe even a small supercomputer. I checked the console one last time. There, there had to be more information somewhere. After nearly 30 minutes with no new leads and no messages from anyone, I almost gave up until I saw something hidden. Where it was hidden, it was hard to explain. It was like an icon that was only visible between two different pixels on the screen. But at the same time, the icon took up the entire screen, just behind the wallpaper. Like a mosaic hidden because I was too busy looking at individual stones of the art. The hidden icon was a smiling sun surrounded by eight differently colored crescent moons. When I clicked on the icon, my screen changed, and this time it got a lot harder to read and understand. Technically, there was nothing wrong with the screen. The words were understandable and readable, just white print on a dark background. But the letters making up the words were constantly changing. They would change font, orientation, language, and even what the letters Hers would shift. But still, when you read the letters together, they formed words. Words that were technically different, but still had the same definition or close enough that it was understandable. The top link said it was a hypervisor, but then it was a virtual machine or a digital computer before shifting back to the hypervisor, which gave me somewhat of an answer of what was happening with the console. What I thought was the OS and the computer I was working on this entire time was just a virtual machine on a much larger server. A virtual machine was a bit like a computer within a computer. It could be a different model, different OS, and much more easily limited because the background features were, wouldn't be accessible to the user on the virtual machine. They were often used to create earlier OS models to interact with programs that were no longer compatible with newer operating systems. Video game consoles were based on a similar idea, when they were running games on a system that was no longer supported. The system existed within another system, and you were none the wiser. So if I was just working on a system that was within a larger system, the question remained. What was the larger system? The simple black background with white text made me think it was a server core. No graphics to use, just a lot of reading and raw data in a language I could barely read. Skimming over the words and already feeling a headache form in my behind my eyes, 
I tried to find something worth the literal headache. Data collection, inputs collated, information spreadsheet. Wait, was I just reading the same thing over and over? It certainly felt like it. Not sure what else to do. I pressed enter over the data collection link and a massive spreadsheet appeared in front of me. Every bit of data on the screen was the same as the measurements on my dials. But the spreadsheet was constantly growing, adding results seen on the dials so quickly I had a hard time keeping up. But thankfully the y-axis had the times listed. The data collection program was collecting the results on the dials in a second by second format. This was a level of data collection that should not be feasible, and yet here I was watching the spreadsheet grow in front of my eyes like an assembly line, taking raw data of space and chewing it before spitting out, out as these headache inducing numbers right in front of me. They were easier to read, but a lot harder to understand, if that makes any sense. For example, one value would have a 5, but then it would twist into a 17, and then an H, and then 4.98 before starting the process over again. This felt like utter nonsense and something that came out of a Charles Dogson poem, rather than something that was used for scientific research. Still though, this felt like evidence as I took a picture of the screen and left that spreadsheet to head back to the main screen. Overwhelmed by what felt like dozens, if not hundreds of shifting links, I just clicked over to the hypervisor where everything felt comfortable and easy to understand. I watched the blinking cursor over and over as a thought occurred to me. It felt quiet on the screen. I, I don't mean it was literally quiet. There was no actual sound that could be heard or felt, but the shifting script felt like it was making a buzzing noise in the back of my mind. It was like the general din that you heard in the background of a movie. It sounded normal and like people were talking, but if you focused on the background noise rather than the noise in the foreground, you realized it was all just nonsense. Sure, you may recognize a word or two, but the context, tone, and meaning were all jumbled up and impossible to understand. Wait, shifting script? Where did that term come from? I never heard anything like that before, but it fits so well here. In thinking about the shifting script, it was like it was itching its way into my mind. Something deep within me enjoyed the way they looked, and wanted to see more, read more, devour it all like I was starving. I don't drink. I never tried chems, and I never found anything I truly found addicting. But the feeling was reminding me of what my father described as craving for his alcohol. Something all-consuming within you that made everything else feel irrelevant. Anything you were doing or not doing was just related to getting this into your body. Something in me changed when I was around shifting script, and now that I was without the shifting script, I wanted more. My thoughts were thinking about how easy it would be to just click over to the hypervisor look over all of the near illegible words. I needed it. The script scratched away inside my mind, and if I didn't feed it, then it would crawl out of my mind, leaving me only a husk. But as it skittered through my mind, a familiar shifting occurred within my heart. The howl that now lived within me felt the foreign intruder, and it was not happy. Even as I clenched my jaw shut, the howl escaped through my gritted teeth. A howl of a man in pain. A howl of a man about to cause pain. And the howl of a charging army all echoed through my mouth and through the OSS. When it finished, 
I could no longer feel itching within my mind, nor could I exactly remember what the shifting script looked like. I remembered it was changing values and letters while keeping the same definition, but the exact curve and cut of the shapes were no longer there. My desire was now dulled. What the hell was that? I asked the empty space station. I wasn't myself for a moment. I was someone who was willing to stare at the shifting script for the rest of my days. But I also knew that if I did that, then the itching inside my mind would have turned into scratching, then clawing, and eventually digging, as the letters of that intoxicating language would be stained and burned into every square centimeter of the OSS. And even then, it wouldn't be enough. That was a dark path I watched my father take, and I would not go down it myself. I noticed my console had a message for my liaison. As I prepared to check the message, my anxious heart was already racing. They never contacted me with good news, and they would probably be sending me a message, either about some new tedious task that would take away my only free time, or announce another orbit around an alternate Earth. Still, though, not reading the message wouldn't keep it from existing, and refusing to read it meant that the message inside was every bad message until it was read. Clicking on the message, I read the short missive inside. Of course, why not? The message read, Your console will be unavailable for 72 hours, and so will your radio as part of an update, beginning immediately. After I read the message, the console turned black and my own face stared back in the glass. Do you think they do that on purpose, or it just happens like that? I asked nobody in particular as I looked around the OSS. Already bored with the same room, my eyes drifted to the window below as I saw something that sh should not be possible. Taped to the window leading out to the void, was an envelope. That was definitely not there just a minute ago. Picking up the letter, I stared at the front. Sure enough, it was addressed to me, and it was from Red Prince of River City. And the stamp in the right corner was a winged woman carrying a torch in hand. A figure I didn't recognize, but somewhere in my memory said she was familiar. But it wouldn't say from where. Anything better to do, I opened the envelope, and inside was a pen and a blank piece of paper that was folded around the real message. I unfolded the letter from the Red Prince as I began to read. Well, the news you gave me is quite concerning. I'll need to consult with Tiffany as soon as I can, but I have no information on any legendary figure named the Star Sailor or the Seraphim. The only information I can find on those names is the Star Sailor is the word astronaut translates into from Hellenes, but I am not sure what it means in this context. Seraphim is a pr pr plural word that describes the highest ranking of angels. It can mean war angels, burning one, burning serpent, or may use it as some generic term for a six-winged angel. Titles like Star Sailor and Seraphim are very dependent on the context of what they are being used for, or the person using them. For example, Azrael can be the angel that took every firstborn from Kemet, or the angel that delivered the prophetic dreams to Joseph. But without the concept context, all you know is that Azrael is in Kemet, and you don't know if it's to take life or save it. As for the Legion of the Black Moon, I do have some information about that. Bear in mind I'm summarizing the entire textbook's worth of information on Astoria. The Legion of the Black Moon was one of the eight nations before the un unfurcation. 
worship the Black Moon and acted very similar to the way the Hunters Guild acts in our world. Hunting monsters, acting as a diplomatic arm between human and non-human communities, and saving lives where they could. However, they also practice sacrifice to the Black Moon and to the leader who they called the Voice of the Black Moon. The leader of the Legion was an angel who said to be unable to understand the Black Moon's intent and speak for it. Nowadays, the Legion of the Black Moon isn't practiced but still widely studied. That all being said, the mention of the Seraphim and the Legion of the Black Moon, I will advise caution if you see any angels. You'll know that they are by their reflective mass they wear over their face. Do not remove their masks, no matter what. If you see a winged being without a reflective mask, do not let them know you see them. That is not an angel. She is too busy to take your questions. I will continue to investigate down here. Have you had any luck with the council? I finished the letter from the Red Prince and stared down at the blank piece of paper. How was I expected to respond to her with my consul out of commission for the next 72 hours? And more importantly, how the hell did a detective on Earth manage to get a letter into the sealed space station? But then a shiver ran up my spine. The only way to get a letter to me here is if someone was hiding on the OSS with the letter. What actual proof did I have that the Red Prince was on Earth? All I had was her word and the word of a stranger from a dead planet. Her hiding on the OSS would explain how she knew everything that she knew. She would be able to read the rules, hear the howl, and even be able to send messages to my consul. There must be another console hidden within that hatch where she could send messages to my own console. And if she was hidden in the OSS, then maybe everything else was false. If I found her, then there was no Project Argus, no secret plan to connect to new worlds, and no conspiracy to keep me hidden from the world. So, I took a heavy flashlight designed to work even in the vacuum of space, as I drifted over to the hatch and peered inside. Sure enough, all I could see was a ladder, a few blinking lights, and a lot of darkness. I grabbed the handle, and there was a hiss of escaping air as I opened the hatch. I shone the light down into the hatch, and the ladder extended at least 10 meters down as I half drifted and half slid down the ladder into the darkness below. I slid down the ladder, and even with my flashlight on and strapped to my arm, I couldn't see a whole lot down there. Each of the blinking lights had three letters and three numbers, so it definitely had a coded sequence, but it didn't match any code I knew. It wasn't hexadecimal, it wasn't any acronyms that I knew about, it was probably a shortened format for the server names. But if these lights were all server racks, then there were a lot of them. The ladder went down 30 meters and there were dozens of blinking lights every level. And if I was to take a guess, that it would be a server farm with 720 racks. This kind of computing power would be more than enough to explain what I saw on my console. But my thoughts of the Red Prince living down here vanished very quickly. Not only was there no evidence of anyone living there, with no clothes, no food wrappers, no water bottles, nor anything to sustain life, but the most important detail was the smell. My living area of the, in the OSS smelled like someone was living there for a long time. Even with my best cleaning efforts, it still smelled like old sweat, unwashed skin, and other less desirable scents in the recycled air. The HVAC system of the OSS was designed to keep me alive, not comfortable. While I didn't understand all of the details, I did understand that the scrubbers used carbon dioxide that I exhaled, sunlight from the panels, and lithium hydroxide to produce breathable oxygen and drinkable water for me. Artificial photosynthesis to help keep life going, even in space. But the scrubbers did nothing about the bacteria in the air that produced stink. 
If anything, they made it worse because it just moved them all around. But the hidden section of the OSS didn't smell anything like the rest of the OSS. The air had a bit of a plastic tinge to it, but no musty smell nor metallic taste. So for whatever reason, this part of the OSS had not only its own air supply, but it had nothing living in it. Not even bacteria, judging by the lack of dust and smell. Every square centimeter of space on the OSS had to serve some purpose of some kind. So why was this area of the OSS hidden from me? I hadn't made it to the bottom yet, and already my living space had quadrupled. And honestly, there was a bit of excitement in me as I descended deeper and deeper into the darkness. The bottom of the ladder led into a large circular room. The room had no lights as far as I could see in the flashlight's beam, but the wall had a series of windows. Twelve of them, each of them peered out into space. But as I drifted closer to the windows, I saw that there were boxes strapped down just beneath the windows. The first box I approached was directly across from the ladder. It was a perfect cube, a meter to each side and covered in a dark cloth. The cloth was held down by little metallic clips. I unclipped it one at a time. I figured I would peek inside to see what it was. Something was going on here, and I had to figure something out to provide to the Red Prince. I lifted the corner of the dark fabric to peer at the cube underneath, my flashlight shining directly on it. I wasn't sure what I was expecting, but what I saw was definitely not what I was thinking. What was underneath the cloth resembled an aquarium, but it was completely sealed, and as far as I could see, there was no fish inside. But I could see green algae colonies free-floating inside the cube of water. But anywhere I directly shined my flashlight on, the algae started to wilt and turn brown. Whatever this odd algae was, it abhorred a light and started to die when exposed to it. I snapped my light off, trying to see if something would happen, and sure enough, it did. My flashlight off, the algae had a bi dim bioluminescent glow. I watched as the algae gradually grew to replace what was lost. Tiny polyps and branches of green glowing algae overtook the dead colonies, and they were soon twice as dense as they were before. Certainly a curiosity, but I was not sure what this algae had to tell me about what was happening on the OSS. So I fitted the cloth back where it was and clipped it again so it would stay in the darkness. I drifted over to another window, and this box was also a meter in each side, but it wasn't covered with anything. This case was also glass, but instead of being full of water, I guessed it must have been full of a preservative resin. In the center of the case was a single, very large feather. It was almost as long as my wrist and an almost metallic gold-silver mix. It was entrapping to glass at, as I stared at the pins of gold and silver, which reminded me of a sunset filtering through the clouds. I stared at the feather for a long time before I finally tore my eyes away from it and drifted over to the third box. Now committed to seeing what was in these boxes, I peered into this glass box and saw that within it was an amorphous, oily mass that was as red as blood. I watched as it formed cones, stretched pseudopods before collapsing back into itself, forming a cube, then a sphere, before turning amorphous again. Something about the way it moved? It wasn't alive. I knew that deep in my heart, but something about the way it moved t told me that it was both dangerous and animate in some way. That case better keep it contained. The next box had a red painted square around the glass box, clearly made to show that it was not to be approached. What was inside the box was one of the most beautiful and most surreal objects I had ever seen in my life. The inside of the glass case had eight chains of dark iron, one extending from each corner, as it was attached to the object in the center of the box. 
bracing it and keeping the object from moving. What object was in the center of the box, I don't know. It wasn't that I could, didn't see it. I could see it. It wasn't that it wasn't something I didn't recognize. Every time I looked at it, I could feel the warmth of familiarity in my head, but it was like the object itself link left a blank spot in my memory. Now the red box on the floor made a whole lot more sense. If I couldn't see the danger, then I would have to be warned about getting close. But I did notice a dark small rectangle on the glass corner, and as I shined my light on it, I let out a gasp as I recognized the card stuck to the glass. The card had a crescent moon with two pillars below it, and two wolves howling near the pillars. But even if the art wasn't enough to confirm my suspicion, the word underneath the picture was in the common creole of the seven cities, and it told me the name of the object within the case. Number 18. The Moon. Red Prince was right. She wasn't here on the OSS. No one was. But there was an arcana here. How it worked, or how it was being used, I don't know. But maybe Red would be able to help. When my console was done updating in three days, all I could do was see if I could find more clues to send to her when the console was accessible again. I checked the other boxes, but they were all empty, with no marks and no signs about what was to be put in the boxes. No other information and found, I traveled up the ladder to the main part of the OSS, where I closed the hatch behind me, leaving the hidden section of the OSS sealed away. For now. I reread the letter, hoping that there was something I missed, but there didn't seem to be anything missing the letter. So instead, I inspected the paper and the pen that also came with the letter. The paper was blank and a bit of a smooth and durable feel to it, like calligraphy paper. The pen was a modified ballpoint pen designed to work in space. So it was bigger than a typical pen, and when you press the point to the paper, pressurized nitrogen forced ink out of the tip to allow the ink to mark the paper. But as I ran the pen over in my hand, I saw that there was something written on it in small words. Write letter, seal envelope, letter delivered. Was written on the pen. Nothing else left to try. I decided to follow the directions. I had followed weirder instructions, and since it appeared in the OSS, it may be able to communicate with the Red Prince. The hardest part of composing the letter was finding a flat space to write on. The hardest part of composing the letter was finding a flat space to write on. Nearly everything in the OSS was either curved or rounded over, so that there were no sharp edges for me to accidentally cut myself on. Even the glass of the window leading back to Earth was convex, and of course it was unsettling to write on the only thing separating my biosphere from the heliosphere. Eventually, I found myself writing using the flat screen of the console as a clipboard, while I wrote my letter to the Red Prince. Dear Red Prince, I am trying this even though I know logically it shouldn't work, but to sum up what happened, my liaison took down my computer for 72 hours, and with it my connection to Earth since my radio doesn't work without my console. They said it was to allow an update, but somehow I feel like it's a bad idea to be without communication with the Earth for an extensive amount of time. I will have no forewarning of any threats, and something can happen to me, and I will not be able to inform anyone. I did find some clues. There's a lot of processing power here, and at least 720 servers working together on an unknown function. And down in the hidden section of the OSS, there were 12 glass boxes, and four of them contained something. One had algae that died near light. Another had the largest golden silver feather I had ever seen. The third box had something that kept changing its shape, and it was some kind of red oil. The final box, I think, contains the arcana. 
What is in the box, I'm not sure, but it was kept confined with dark iron chains, and there was a card on the box calling it The Moon. I'm not sure how the Arcana is being used, nor if it's safe to try and let it out, but what should I do, if anything? Signed, Samuel Stevens, Lastaname. After finishing the letter, I folded the paper and put it back in the envelope, and it sealed just by closing the envelope. Now the front of the envelope was addressed to the Red Prince of River City with the return address of Samuel Lastaname of the OSS. Where do I leave this letter now? While well, I wondered where I was going to put the letter, I realized that the envelope disappeared from my hand. Whatever mysterious force or entity that brought the letter to me took the letter from me. But now the question remained. If this was my only form of communication with the Red Prince, when was I going to hear from her again? While I pondered these thoughts, I saw something move beyond the window. Curious, I approached the window and looked through it. My heart dropped when I saw that there was something beyond the OSS. Below the OSS, I saw a seek silvery ship that resembled a stingray in shape. It had no glass as far as I could see, and near the tail of the ship was a flag I didn't recognize. It had five vertical red stripes with two diagonal green stripes cutting across them. I remembered rule number seven. I couldn't access the rules without the console, but I was pretty sure that rule number seven said I wasn't supposed to see any other satellites or shuttles during my mission. But if I did, then I would need to take pictures of what I saw. Taking the digital camera, I took a picture of the strange ship just before it dashed away, moving far faster than my eye could track. At first, I figured it simply disappeared. But then I heard a familiar knock on the airlock. Something was outside of the OSS and trying to get in. As my heart pounded, I tried to keep myself calm. You've dealt with this before. You just have to keep them from knowing that you are in here. I reminded myself, just as the airlock alarm started to blare. Whatever was outside the OSS just got inside the airlock and would be inside the OSS within moments. Now, filled with panic, I glanced around the OSS trying to figure out the best place to hide. I couldn't hide inside the other airlock and inside the shuttle. They would find me too quick. I could try to ride the shuttle back to Earth, but that wouldn't work either. Either their ship would catch me, or because of what the rules said, they said if I return too soon, I may never leave. That only left me with one option. The hatch leading to the hidden section of the OSS. I had a hard time seeing it until I heard the Black Moon's howl, so there's a more than fair chance that whatever kept it hidden from me would also keep it hidden from them. I kicked myself over to the hatch and quickly opened it and slid inside before closing it behind me. Not even a minute after I closed the hatch, the inner airlock opened and the intruders walked into the OSS. When I saw them, I saw that they weren't even close to being human. The first being that entered the OSS was spider-like in the way that it walked with eight limbs, except each of the limbs were shaped like overextended human arms, with hands ending in 12 fingers as it pulled itself into the OSS. The main body was almost shaped like an elongated bean with no eyes nor nostrils, but it did have a large mouth as it explored the OSS by touch. And its skin, its skin looked like it was smooth and warm. The intruder that followed had no legs, but it hovered. It had a metallic cowl and a vaguely human torso with two arms and one head but I couldn't see any of its features except for two glowing red eyes. 
The hovering creature appeared to be in charge as it hovered over to the console and tried getting it on, but after a few failed keyboard taps, it simply turned away, apparently frustrated, while the spider creature wandered and walked over the hatch I was hiding beneath. I could see the snarling mouth mere inches away from me as I held my breath, scared that this creature would find the hatch release and decide to attack me. But after a moment, it continued away, and the floating creature kept trying to access my console while the crawling creature went through all my things. After half an hour of tense anxiety, the floating creature and the crawling one both headed over to the airlock from whence they came, and it closed behind them. I stayed below for another ten minutes before I crawled out of the hidden tunnel. Whatever concealed the hatch worked on them too, but as far as I could see, they left whatever they were, and they left everything where it was supposed to be. Still though, I whatever they were, I had a very bad feeling about them. Not much else happened for the rest of the day. I did some exercises for a few hours, but with my only connection to the outside now just being a singular window, I just needed something to do more than anything. And when it came time for sleep, I went to sleep surprisingly easily. I guess the anxiety and exercise wore me out enough that sleep came easily. While sleeping, I dreamt of the hidden section of the OSS. In my dream, in the hidden section, I saw a woman dressed in white robes and kneeling before an empty throne. There was silence in the darkness, but it felt like there was a lot said in the silence, while the woman continued to bow before the throne, before she tried to stand. But as she stood up, a purple shadow who rose behind her. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. As I watched the figure in purple force the woman down to the ground. The woman now prostrated herself before the throne, as the hooded figure in purple sat on the throne. Now on the throne, the figure was then holding a cane in one hand, and an hourglass that flowed upwards in its other hand. And I watched as more and more people prostrated before the figure on purple, on the formerly empty throne. I saw a man with long hair offer a crossbow before the figure, who didn't so much as glance at the man, as the purple figure stomped on his head, leaving the man broken and still on the ground. I saw a knight with a trident made of bone offer her weapon, only to have the figure take up the trident and stab it through her plate mail leaving her pierced heart on the ground and her trident holding her body up from the ground. And then the most heartbreaking of all, I saw a young woman with a jean jacket and a crown on her back stare up at the figure with utter hatred, refusing to bow or even stand on her knees. Even as her skin rotted away, leaving only her skeleton in her jacket, I could still see her stare up at the figure with hatred. Even when the figure struck at her skull with its cane, she still stood strong as ever and stared at it with a burning hatred that didn't dare fade. When I woke up, I didn't know how to interpret the dream. I usually didn't dream at all, let alone dream of something that was so visual. That day was pretty quiet, nothing changed, and nothing happened. I checked the readings that I could understand, I exercised, I ate, and I waited for either another letter to appear, or my console to turn back on. You don't realize how much you depend on contact and stimulation until it is gone. Everything was dependent on my console. No music, no radio, no communication. The only thing that there was to do was look down on the planet or exercise. There was no work to do, no one to talk to, and 
nothing to listen to. After the end of the third day with no message from anyone and my console still off, I began to get worried. I managed to convince myself I was off by just a few hours and would just need some extra time before I was back up and running again. When the seventh day began without my console, paranoia officially took over. There was still no message from Red and no letter, no matter where I checked on the OSS. Not too long ago, I thought the most terrifying thing that could happen to me was something breaking into the OSS. But after a week of complete silence, I realized the most terrifying thing was waiting for something to happen. When something happened, I had a clear problem to face, and I just had to solve that problem. But now, there was nothing, just waiting for the stick to hit. I glanced at the airlock that led to the shuttle. I could try to ride the shuttle back, but the rules said that if I return too soon, I may never leave. But the mission was supposed to last six months. I don't think I can last an additional five months in complete isolation with no connection to anyone. I don't even know why I'm still trying to follow the rules since they've already been broken by my liaison. The rules said that my liaison could be reached at any time, but they've been out of reach for a full week. There could be a disaster back on Earth and I would have no way of knowing. I could die up here and no one would know that I ever lived up here. That final thought made me shiver. If anything could happen to me and no one would know, that had to be their plan. They must have known that I made it into the hidden section of the OSS and now would rather have me die up here than have me survive with the knowledge of what was down there. If they would leave me to die up here, then I was going to ruin their plans. Taking my flashlight and a socket wrench down, I cr took the ladder down into the hidden section of the OSS. I made my decision. If what they kept in prison down there was capable of creating paths to other worlds, Maybe it could create a path to Earth for me, if I let it out. In the hidden section, I shined a light into the box with the chains and the object I couldn't see. But I still had a feeling that what was in there could hear me and was listening to me. I can let you go, but when I let you go, you need to open a path for me so I can go back to Earth. Can you do that for me? I asked the thing in the box. It felt like the object inside nodded, or at least acknowledged what I said. So, now in too deep, I decided to let it go. The chains inside of the box had a socket on the outside that could be tightened or loosened with a socket wrench. It didn't take long to loosen the first socket, and after the chain slackened, the object inside of the box drifted more within the confines of the glass cube. It didn't take too much longer to loosen all of the chains, and when the last chain slackened, the object within the case vanished, and so did the card on the box, leaving it empty. I released the moon from its prison, and it didn't take me with it. As the realization began to dawn on me, I noticed that there was another letter from the Red Prince taped to the window. Grabbing the letter, I saw something else that was impossible beyond the window. Drifting near the OSS, there was a woman in a purple dress, drifting, her face facing away from the OSS, and wearing no EVA suit as far as I could see. I could see her dark skin pe peeking through her dress and her hair floating around her head, like a halo. But that wasn't the most unbelievable part. The most unbelievable part was the fact she had large feathered wings on her back that were the same shade of purple as her dress. And I could very clearly see that she was still moving and still breathing. I don't know what took over me, but I quickly climbed up to where my EVA hung and put it on and made it sure that I had my oxygen on and Red's letter tucked away somewhere safe. 
but after I put on my helmet and I prepared to go out in the airlock, a twinge of fear filled me. I released the Arcana, it disappeared, and then suddenly both a letter appears and a complete stranger. This might be some kind of trick, but if it isn't a trick, then there is someone out there who's still alive. Maybe they could help me get back home, or maybe I could just have some company. But I definitely wasn't going to wait to read the letter before I headed out. Time was short. I faced the airlock leading out. I flipped a final switch, and the oxygen fled the airlock. And then the outer door opened, revealing the darkness outside. The space beyond the airlock was even more disorienting to look beyond. The EVA suit was created for short trips outside of the OSS, and like everything on the station, it was constructed in the Seven Cities, and I was essentially trusting it to stay sealed and keep me alive long enough to find the figure beyond the OSS. The suit had enough breathable air for about an hour and a full mobility pack, Similar to a jetpack, but it used compressed carbon dioxide to allow free-range movement in space. I did have to be careful with it, because when it was out, it was out, and I would be left to drift in space. Even if I was only a meter away from the OSS, I could still be stuck with no way of reaching it, left to die so close to safety that I would never reach. Still... I had a literal lifeline, a 300 meter long rope and a modified climbing clip, similar to those used by mountain climbers. It would keep the rope from extending unless I wanted it to extend, and could even be used to pull me back into the airlock. Still, even with that knowledge, a lot of intrusive thoughts bothered me as I double checked my lifeline to the OSS. What if a piece of space junk collided with my helmet, cracking it open? What if the rope broke? It was supposed to be rated for almost 2,000 kilograms, but still, things may happen. Still, I quieted these thoughts with a simple statement of fact. Worrying about the problems won't make it easier. Focus on the problem in front of me, and just bring the winged woman back to the OSS. I took my first step out of the OSS and let myself float beyond the relative safety of the station. Even just a few meters beyond the airlock, I could feel cold sweat drip down my forehead. I had to stay calm. I couldn't wipe the sweat out of my eyes. I saw the being drift about five meters beyond the bottom of the OSS, if you thought of the planet as being over me. Using the joystick to allow me to float over to where the woman lay. When I was within reach of her, I gently grabbed her arm and twisted her body, bringing her face to mine. When I saw her face, I almost screamed in my helmet until I realized I wasn't looking at her face. Where her face should have been was instead a mirrored mast. It almost looked like a sun shield used by my helmet, but instead of being golden, it was silver. I saw my own helmet reflected in her mask, and something in my heart told me I didn't want to remove that mask. That must have allowed her to breathe in space, but how did it keep her exposed skin safe from micrometeorites, extreme temperature, and the lack of pressure? She should be dead by now, but even now, I could still see she was breathing, and her fingers and toes were twitching like she was sleeping. I pressed my helmet to where her mask was as I spoke. That way, the sound would carry through my helmet to her mask while I spoke. Hopefully, she was responsive, but this style of communication worked to communicate with other astronauts when we didn't share a communication channel. Who are you? Are you okay? I asked her. I heard her breathing evenly, but 
no words. She must have been passed out, or even asleep for some reason. So I grabbed her wrist and pulled myself with the automated climbing gear. While we were pulled back, I remembered a story about one of the first men in space. A cosmonaut from Scythia who experienced multiple technical issues and had to pull himself back into his own craft by hand. It was so arduous that he lost about 17 pounds in water weight just from pulling himself back to the capsule in mere minutes. Blinded by his own sweat, unable to see, barely able to breathe, and no knowledge that he was going to survive. He still made it to the capsule and crashed it back into Earth where he nearly froze to death while wild animals tried to get into the broken down capsule. And still, even with all of that, he survived, and even now he was living a nice, peaceful life somewhere in the northern forest. Hence the automated climbing clip to pull me back into the OSS. Even if the Seven Cities wanted to pretend that no one else had been to space before, they weren't dumb enough to not prepare an engineering solution for that eventuality. Just outside the airlock began the awkward part of bringing my unexpected guest into the OSS. All six of her limbs had been splayed out and could very easily bang into the edges of the airlock. It was relatively easy to straighten her legs and cross her arms on her chest, like she was asleep, or like she was dead. Her wings were a bigger unknown, though. I didn't know where her bones or joints were in her wings, and I didn't want to break them by mistake. Feeling them with my gloved hands, I tried my best not to feel invasive while doing so. Even when I told myself I was just trying to get her into the OSS, it felt wrong when I felt her wings, like I was invading her privacy. After feeling her wings with my gloves, I was surprised that I couldn't feel any bones at all through the gloves. I could feel the texture of the feathers even through the thick gloves. They were almost metallic, and even running my fingers across them, I didn't ruffle them. I could also feel strong but flexible muscle under the feathers. But the wings moved easily enough without too much resistance. After I checked for bones a second time, I folded her wings around her body like a blanket. She still didn't move or acknowledge what happened as I brought her into the airlock. I closed the external door while I let the airlock fill with atmosphere, and then I opened the internal door and carried the strange being into my living space. I removed my EVA and placed it back where it went, but it was a lot harder to put it away with a passed out floating body in the middle of the room. But with my EVA away, I checked my first aid kit for anything that might be helpful. Sadly, there wasn't a lot there. Some gauze, bandages, and antiseptic wipes. But then again, what can I really check for someone with wings who spent at least 10 minutes in a complete vacuum and appeared to only be passed out? But then I saw next to the first aid kit was my exercise kit. And then I had an idea about how to check to see if she was alright. One of the devices in my exercise kit was a pulse oximeter. In addition to measuring a pulse, it measured the oxygen saturation in my blood while I worked out. Essentially the same device you can buy from any pharmacy or exercise shop down on Earth. But here, it would tell me a lot more about my unconscious guest. I carefully unfolded a wing and clicked the oximeter to her index finger. After a few seconds, it beeped, telling me it had her heart rate and oxygen saturation. I lifted the oximeter to my face and read it. Her pulse was a normal resting rate of 54 BPM, a little lower than some people, but not unheard of for athletes to go that low. Her oxygen rate, on the other hand, should not have been possible. 
it was only 5%. Not 50%, 5%. Brain damage and circulatory arrest could occur when you went as low as 60%. A normal range should be between 90% and 100%. She should be long dead at these levels. And just to test it to make sure it wasn't the oximeter, I put it on my own finger. And sure enough, my heart rate was 84 BPM, and my oxygen saturation was at 98%. So it wasn't the oximeter, and here I was, another impossible thing, just in front of me for me to solve. I almost reached out for her mask when something inside of me screamed not to do that. The same place where I heard the black moon's resonance also told me not to remove the angel's mask. But I did remember I had a letter from the Red Prince. I quickly opened it and read it over. The first thing I noticed was the date. It was dated a week ago. How did I miss this letter for a whole week? I read the letter, hoping for an answer. Unfortunately, I got one. Dear Samuel, the news you bring me is quite concerning. Doing some digging, I found out that they're using the Arcana to create paths by creating a ritual and using a 30-digit number that is generated randomly. And then using this number like a key, they can open the paths relative to their position on the planet of the world of their choice. Each world gets their own number, and the Empire of the Seven Cities as a path only they can open. From what I heard about, the objects keep the moon, and they're likely just dangerous. And you should not release the moon, whatever you do. The Arcana is tricky, and has the ability to conceal, hide, and also reveal and uncover. They are not illusions, like those made by the Knight of Swords, but they are still dangerous. So always examine what you know, what you think isn't there, and you may see something else. If the Arcana was to get out, then it would be able to go anywhere it wants, and it has no loyalty nor mercy for any human being. And for the Empire of the Seven Cities, spent more time imprisoning the moon than they have spent on the rest of the OSS. They will not hesitate to sacrifice you if they think it will give them the moon. So right away, the smart move is to keep the Arcana steeled away, and we will look for our opportunity to bring you back to Earth. If you think there's any pressing information, please feel free to inform me. Sincerely, The Red Prince. I finished reading her letter, glanced at the floating figure in front of me, and with the knowledge that I released the Arcana before I found the letter. Ah, Tavit, I swore to myself as I grabbed the blank piece of paper and the pen as I started to transcribe my letter back to The Red Prince. Dear Red Prince, I regret to inform you that I've already released the Arcana and it teleported itself away. I wasn't able to see your letter until after it was released. Is there anything I can do to keep myself safe? And also, I found someone floating outside the OSS with no spacesuit and no idea how she is alive. But she is. She also has purple wings and some kind of silvery mirror mask. I almost want to say she's an angel, but she doesn't look like any angel that I am familiar with. I also had two odd visitors. A spider-like creature that was made out of humanoid arms and a large mouth. And it had a boss that was floating and wore a metal cowl, so I couldn't see its body. But it had red glowing eyes. I want to say they're alien life forms of some kind, but I'm not sure. They were in a spaceship shaped like a stingray with a flag I have never seen before. They didn't notice me because I found a way to hide, but that was definitely unsettling. My console is also still inaccessible. No messages from my liaison, and at this point, I am fairly certain they are leaving me up here to die. I still have my shuttle, which I think can take me back to Earth, but with my guest. And the fact that the moon is gone, 
I don't know what I should do, but if I sense any danger, I will be evacuating the OSS into Hera 1 and try to ride back to Earth before anything else happens. I sealed the letter and watched it vanish as I drifted over to my console to see if I could turn it on or get some kind of information from the computer. But still, it was off and nothing I did turned it back on. But as I checked over the dials, I noticed that the oxygen level was starting to dip below normal when I heard movement behind me. I whirled around to see the figure was now moving. She unwrapped her wings from around her body and was moving around in a quick panic. First, she lifted her hands to her mask, but after she confirmed that it was still there, she calmed down a little bit, but still got as far away from me as possible in the tiny space. And then she slowly turned to face me. Her wings were draped like a cape behind her, and I could see my own terrified face reflected in her mask as she stared at me. After staring at each other in silence for nearly five minutes, she finally spoke to me. What she said, I couldn't understand. It didn't resemble any language that I knew. The only word I could pick up on was LCL, and that was because she said it many times. Maybe LCL was what she was looking for? I shook my head and lifted my empty arms up to indicate that I didn't understand her. She let out an audible sigh and tried a different language. This one I recognized as Latin. Even if I only understood some words and my grammar was terrible, but I figured I could try to respond to her questions. Ubi some? She asked me. She asked where she was. Uh, super taram. I told her that she was above the earth. Quomodo ad al ciel. How do I get to al ciel? She asked me. Again, I shook my head, feeling tired of not having any answers for anyone, not even myself. Quid est al ciel? I asked her what al ciel is. And she responded with one word. Asa. Her home. After that response, there was only more silence until I decided to break it by offering her my name. Samuel, I said, pointing at myself. The angel nodded and pointed at herself. Sariel, Sariel told me. Something about her name caused the thing inside of me to shift. At first, I thought it was fear. But then I realized it was familiarity. The resonance that still lived inside of me recognized Sariel, even if I didn't. So, with that in mind, I figured it would be best to let the resonance speak. Once again, I relaxed and let it slither up my throat, and the resonance spoke in my voice. The language wasn't one I understood, and it felt like the words echoed in the OSS, and they echoed back with different words and different meanings. Sariel turned her head, and even though I couldn't see her face through her mask, I thought she must have been confused by what was happening. Sariel responded in the same echoing language that made my head hurt and my thoughts feel smoky as I let my mind drift and let the resonance speak for me. While I let my thoughts drift away, I wondered about what was living inside of me now. It spoke for me, and it advised me, and it seemed to know more about what was going on than I did. Every time I let it speak, I felt more and more powerful. But... It also felt like it was taking up more and more space inside of me. The conversation between Sariel and the resonance became heated as Sariel began to gesticulate as she spoke, and I became 
dimly aware that she was approaching my body. Her wings unfolded behind her. But this time, instead of only two wings, she had six somehow, and they were stretched out almost 10 meters each. Which is odd because the OSS wasn't big enough for her to fully stretch out her wings. I was also vaguely aware of black smoke that began to fill the OSS. Still, I didn't feel threatened. I just relaxed and let the resonance speak for me, confident that the sound would keep me safe. Sariel's wings went through another change. In any other situation, watching as every single feather opened up, revealing hundreds or even thousands of eyes, both red and blue, all focusing on me with the precision of a predator, would have been unsettling. But here, it wasn't. I watched as her hair behind her head moved like many venomous snakes, waiting to bite at her prey. And her mask reflected my floating face. In her mirror mask, I could see that my eyes were glazed over. My slack-jawed mouth was open, with black smoke slithering out of my mouth. A snake of smoke that left my mouth with the resonance was beginning to curl around my legs. The head rose higher and higher as it constricted more and more of my body. Before I knew what was happening, Sariel flew across the OSS and slammed my mouth shut. That broke me out of my trance. My mouth now shut, my eyes focused, and I could see my own terrified expression in Sariel's mask. And I realized just how tight my legs and chest were being constricted by the smoke. As it dissipated and I stared at my reflection in Sariel's mask, and even though I couldn't see her face, by how much her hands shook as she held my jaw, she was either angry or terrified of me. Or possibly both. Legion, she spat at me. Her tone was full of venom as the smoke finally dissipated. She let go of my mouth finally, and when I opened my mouth to ask what happened, she struck my mouth again, covering it with her mouth. Her expressionless mask conveyed an almost murderous intent as she stared me down through it. Legion! She repeated herself like it was the most important thing in the world. After two minutes, she let go of my mouth, and this time I stayed silent. Once again, my most important skill, and the one that guaranteed I didn't get any answers. Once again. Sariel took a relaxed breath, and the many eyes on her wings closed before her wings folded into themselves and went from six back into two that she folded behind her back. Sariel stared me down before she turned to the airlock and left the OSS. I drifted to the airlock window and watched as Sariel opened the external door and stared down at the planet below. In the vacuum of space, she moved with no difficulty and breathed as I saw her chest rise and fall, even though there was no air. I watched as she braced against the edge of the OSS and pushed off, aiming herself towards the earth below. I drifted over to the window inside the OSS proper that allowed me to look down at the earth. And I watched as Sariel fell towards the earth. Her wings splayed out behind her while she fell into the atmosphere, igniting as she fell to the earth, a burning phoenix, while I watched her disappear into the earth beyond my view. Nope. I'm done. I'm leaving this crazy place, I said, as I glanced at the oxygen levels in the OSS again. They were still dropping, and if I was reading it correctly, 
I would start experiencing hypoxia within a few minutes if I didn't leave. Taking slow breaths, I quickly put on the EVA suit and went over the emergency landing procedures in my head. Back on Earth, there were procedures to follow. I would inform ground control via radio, and they would offer guidance, while I would take the best vectors to get Hera-1 back to Earth. But here, I was told not to return too early, and the radio was still non-functional. I only had my myself to rely on. My EVA suit on, and now my own oxygen supply. I still watched the oxygen dial drop. Even without me breathing in the OSS, something else was burning the oxygen. But I couldn't stay here, even if I wanted to. Solving that mystery would take too much time. My suit's air supply wouldn't last long either, just over an hour. Every piece built by the Seven Cities, I reminded myself as I went to the airlock that had the shuttle. I heard that every other nation had EVAs that could last 16 hours with oxygen. My EVA would have a little over an hour. I entered the shuttle and went through all my procedures to disembark from the OSS. It didn't take too long, but I still felt a cold sweat while I went through all of my checks. Even on the shuttle, my radio to ground control was off and wouldn't turn on. But at least I was able to let go of the OSS and let the Hera-1 drift into her first vector. The process of bringing the shuttle back to Earth from the OSS safely would take three hours. But ironically, even if the shuttle came directly back to Earth in a crash landing, it wouldn't be that much faster. It would take me two hours to fall to Earth. As I hit my first vector and the Hera-1 made its way back to Earth, I checked my oxygen reserves on the Hera-1 when I realized that the shuttle had almost no oxygen. Only 5% of the atmosphere was oxygen and 10% of it was carbon dioxide, and the other 85% was nitrogen. The air in the Hera-1 was completely unbreathable to me. I checked my oxygen timer on my EVA suit. I had an hour and five minutes left of breathable air in my suit. Even as I focused my efforts on hitting my next vectors, the horror dawned on me about what happened. They never intended for me to come back. I was supposed to die on the OSS. That's why the Hera-1 didn't have breathable air, and why my EVA didn't have enough air for the trip. Even if I left the OSS in the shuttle, I was never going to return. I would suffocate in silence with no way to reach Earth long before I got to breathable air, and the shuttle would crash into the Earth with no one to know what happened. My entire life, my legacy, my love for my empire, a flaming crater in the Earth with no one to miss me. Well except maybe my brother. With that thought, I took slow, calm breaths as I continued to hit my vectors. The only thing that panic would do is burn up my oxygen quicker. If I stayed calm, I would last longer, and maybe I would find a way back to Earth safely, like Sariel did. As time passed on and I hit more vectors, I thought about the regrets in my life. I thought about the love of my life and how I broke her heart after we graduated high school. I was on a fast track to be a pilot. She was going to take a gap year working as a club hostess. My father told me to forget her because where she was going to work, she was going to be stuck there forever. 
but I was supposed to be a hero to the Seven Cities. My mother told me to give up this career for her, and to wait for her, that I may never find love again if I let this girl go. I followed my father's advice, and they divorced soon after that argument. And as much as I want to blame myself, realistically, it was a million other things. I was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Neither of them asked me what I wanted to do, and I used my most important skill of staying silent about my wants, so they both figured they knew what I wanted. I wanted her to come with me, and to this day I wondered if she ever would have said yes. But I remained silent, and everyone else decided they knew what I wanted to do. A warning alarm went off in my helmet. Only 30 minutes of breathable air left in my suit. I turned off the alarm, but the red light on my arm still blinked. But now the alarm was muted, at least for now. But still, it was distracting to notice that the cockpit of the Hera 1 looked like it was full of blood, as I thought back to our last family dinner. Before I graduated from the pilot program, everyone met for dinner. Even after the divorce, both my mom and dad insisted on trying to be a family. There was a fight between Ethan and both my parents. I don't remember what it was that started it, but I still remember that rare time where both my mother and father agreed. They called Ethan trash for working as a barista. They told him that he was the failure of the family, not them. My mother said that he was dead to her, and my father told Ethan to get out of the house and never come back that it would be better for the family if he never came back. And as far as he was concerned, Ethan was never a part of the family. At that time, I remember Ethan's eyes full of tears and his mouth full of sobs as he looked to his siblings to defend him. My sister only flipped him off, and I was, of course, silent. It didn't matter that I didn't agree with my mother nor father. I had to remain silent, otherwise their anger would be turned towards me instead of Ethan. So naturally everyone at the table assumed I agreed with Ethan, and he left the house. I haven't seen him since. But it still didn't take long for my mother and father to turn their anger towards me. That very night, my mother told me that I was dead to her for not taking my shot at love. My father, about a week later, left me a long, angry voicemail explaining how I never supported him, nor his choices, so he was going to live in Scythia, where his lifestyle was encouraged. The last I heard from him was nine months later, as he left an even longer, even angrier, rambling message about how he was stuck fighting horses to get his next drink. Naturally, I was quiet the entire time. I never let them know what I was feeling, and after a while, even I wasn't sure what I felt. Long after those incidents, I just stayed focused on my work. It was easier to not think of myself as a person with feelings and needs. I was just a pilot, serving my emperor. I did a good job, and I moved on to the next one when it was complete. It was almost like I was in a perpetual daze, as I did my job and went back home. This was my way. Something in me told me that there was a reward at the end of the rainbow for all of my hard work. But I didn't even know what I was working towards at the end of everything. Love? Money? Accomplishment? Glory? 
No matter what I did, I didn't know what I was seeking out. But I figured if I just did the hard work and did as I was told, then there was going to be a reward. But now, as I stare at my 15-minute warning of oxygen, and I hit yet another vector as I descended to Earth, I realized that this was the end of my rainbow. I was the one who volunteered for every big project. Because I was silent about my complaints and needs, so clearly I didn't have any, or at least that's what everyone thought, including myself. I was someone who did the impossible task without saying it was impossible. The Empire of the Seven Cities didn't see me as someone loyal to the Emperor and worth rewarding. I was just another tool worth using and then throwing away. I felt tears fill my eyes as my suit gave my final low oxygen warning. No minutes left, just a persistent beeping I couldn't turn off, and the red light bathed the cockpit. My head ached in the same rhythm as the beeping. As the edges of my vision blurred and turned dark, and I found myself hyperventilating, even if I wasn't trying to. I hit another vector as a thought occurred in my slow brain. This was where I was going to die, and there was nothing I could do about it. I was too far away and there was no air to breathe, but luckily there would be no pain. I would just let myself fall to sleep and then never wake up. I wouldn't be aware of the crash, and I would suffocate long before I ever reached the ground. I felt myself slip into the darkness. There, I was warm. I was safe. Soon to leave this world for the sunless lands, all I would ever have to do is let myself fall deeper into sleep. It did feel comforting, but something inside of me wanted to fight. It wasn't the resonance. It wasn't anything I was familiar with. But at the same time, it was something that I knew about my entire life. Death was pulling me into the darkness, and even then, something in me wanted to keep living. Everything in the universe was telling me that it was impossible to keep going. Everything was stacked against me. All I had to do was nothing. Remain silent one last time, and I would be free of every problem and every pain in life and everything else in life itself. But now, I was refusing to remain silent. If suffocation told me I was going to die, that this was it, and I would break, then I would respond to suffocation with one simple word. No. I will not break. Not now. Not ever. Not anymore. What? happened next was like I was facing an ocean trying to wash me away while I stood on the beach. But I stood firm. Even as the ocean swallowed me and all that I stood on, I stood strong and told the ocean no. I was going to stay. And the ocean? It obeyed. I woke up with full focus and strength as I hit my last vector. I must have pa been passed out for a while, because I was really off course with less than a kilometer away from the ground below, as I aimed Hera 1 the best I could to reduce the crash. It wasn't a lot of time, but I did show slow the shuttle down some before impact with the sand below. The metal around me crumbled like paper, and 
It was the most horrendous noise I had heard in my life. As I was flung forward through the front of the shuttle, tearing through both glass and metal and into the dune directly in front of me. And even though I lifted my arms up to try to protect myself, I didn't feel any pain or any discomfort. After being stunned for a few moments, I stood up and trudged up the dune to examine the wreck. And sure enough, when I made it up to the top of the dune, I saw that below me was a massive crater of fused glass, steel, and flame. I survived that crash when I really shouldn't have. I checked my gloved hands, and as far as I could see, the suit wasn't even scuffed, let alone torn up. I had no broken bones, no bruises, and no discomfort of any kind. This definitely shouldn't be possible. I decided to examine myself as I tried to unclasp my helmet to examine in myself, but the clasp wouldn't open. After a few failed attempts, I decided to try my gloves. Those clasps wouldn't work either. I couldn't even get them to budge a little bit. After a few more failed attempts, I decided to leave them be. I wasn't uncomfortable, at least until I realized something else. My breath wasn't fogging up the glass in front of my face. In fact, I couldn't hear my breath at all. I tried panting and screaming, but that didn't do anything. What is this? I asked. And I could hear my voice, but as a scratchy electronic noise that came from outside my suit, not within it. Whatever happened to my body, it was almost like I wasn't in my suit anymore. This dark thought didn't bother me like I thought it would. I had done the impossible once again, but this time for myself. I would have a second chance at a good life, and all I had to do was try and find the Red Prince. She was somewhere in River City, right? I glanced around the desert, and I saw a freeway a few kilometers away. I started to trudge towards the freeway while I let my feet carry me there. Whatever happened in space and in that crash, I left Samuel Stevens' last aname in that wreck. And now I, Star Sailor, Legion of the Black Moon, trekked to find that mysterious detective, the Red Prince.